Welcome to today's Georgetown Alumni Lifelong Learning Webinar hosted by the Georgetown University Alumni Association. Thank you for taking time out of your day to join us for this session, Nurture and Thrive, Simple Steps to Live in Good Health with college alumna Elizabeth O'Connor Cole. I'm Kelly Young, Associate Director of Strategic Engagement in Alumni Relations, and I'll be facilitating today's webinar. As a quick reminder, today's session is being recorded and the recording will be shared via our follow-up email. You may also use the questions section of your webinar control panel to submit questions for Elizabeth. Now to our presenter, Elizabeth O'Connor Cole, College Class of 1992. Elizabeth is an author, well-being educator, and the founder of Salveo Lifestyle, which offers unique wellness retreats and educational events to nourish the mind, body, and spirit. Elizabeth seeks to demystify the world of wellness by showing how a healthy lifestyle can be simple, fun, and accessible to all. She has traveled the world to study ancient and holistic practices to bring people the best information from trusted experts. Cole speaks about, de about simplifying wellness to live healthfully and purposefully in corporate offices and organizations worldwide, as well as more intimate settings like retreats, private club, clubs, and residences. Without any further ado, I am pleased to turn things over to Elizabeth O'Connor Cole. Good morning. It's so wonderful to be here today. And while we are, you know, I'd rather be in person and seeing all of your wonderful faces, um, this is definitely an exciting opportunity to connect with the Georgetown community that I love and hold so dear. So thank you for joining me today. Um, I'd love to start today with just asking you all to sort of take a moment to become present, to get grounded, and to really um, ask yourself why you're here today. I think this is a great exercise that we can all incorporate into our lives, whatever we're doing. What is the why behind how we're spending our time and who we're spending our time with? So. I wonder if today you're here because you like to participate in anything Georgetown puts out. Your why might be that you're interested in learning more about health and wellness, or your why might be that you're my sister-in-law and you're just being on here to be supportive. Whatever the why is, I'd like you to check in with yourself. Take a moment to connect with that why, and then really commit to the next 30 minutes of being present. You know, we're so distracted these days with all of our devices and um, polls in so many directions. It's nice to take that moment to connect to the why and then commit to that time to be fully present, to get something out of um, our 30 to 40 minutes together here this morning. So with that, um, I would love just to give you a little background on myself and how I came to become an author. Um, and a well-being educator. So um, I'm going to go ahead and um, share some slides with you all here, um, which I think you can all see this opening slide, um, which is a picture of me um, at Georgetown back in the day. Um, uh, this is when I was there in 1998 to 1992 um, uh, as a young um, the 18 year old um, arriving on the campus of Georgetown, bright eyed and bushy tailed and ready to um, experience everything that College of Living had to offer. Um, the one thing I will say though is I came with very little education about how to take care of myself. Um, I didn't know much about nutrition and this was at the height of the fat free era. Um, so I was living on bagels from buoy mongers. <laughs> um, uh, Diet Coke and um, having very little knowledge about how all of these things would nurture myself and just, you know, overall how to take care of myself. Running five miles a day, um, very uh, little emphasis on how to rest and balance my body out and take care of myself. So I'd love to throw it out to this group and with a little poll, which Kelly is kindly going to put up on the screen um, and ask you all. Um, this question. There we go. Kelly, can you pull up that poll? 
Yes, the poll is up and we are collecting responses right now. Okay, great. So the question is, how many of you felt that you were prepared mentally and physically to take care of yourselves um, when you arrived at Georgetown? And there's four options there for your response. Nearly all of our audience has uh, replied at this time. So I'm gonna go ahead and close the poll and then we will share the results. Elizabeth, are you able to see those results or shall I, I read them? Sorry, okay. so can you read them, Kelly? Sure, of course. Um, so as Elizabeth said, the question was, how well prepared were you to take care of your mental and physical well-being when you started your college career? And very, very few of you, 1% um, reported that you were very well prepared. 23% um, moderately well, uh, slightly well was 34% of our audience, and then not at all came in at 42%. Wow. All right. Well, it's good to know I'm in good company because as much as my parents um, were amazing and created an, uh, an amazing foundation for me um, in faith and family, um, I just didn't have that knowledge about how to take care of myself, um, let alone how to make a meal or um, how to use my breath to regulate my nervous system. But I don't think a lot of us did. It just wasn't something that was taught or emphasized. So that has really become my mission. So thank you all for sharing. Um, my mission has become to educate people so that they can be more empowered to take care of themselves, so that they can be the CEOs of their own well-being. You know, a few years ago, we went to China um, as a family, and I met with some Chinese medicine doctors there. And one of the things that came clear to me was that in Eastern medicine, um, they view the body as a garden something that needs to be tended to daily, uh, watered, looked after, light exposure, rest in the off, you know, in the off seasons, tilling of the soil, and, you know, generally just looking at the garden and seeing how's it doing, what adjustments do I need to make based on how things are growing. Um, and I think that's a wonderful analogy because I think in the West, we tend to view our health and well-being very much as a machine. And it's something, you know, especially a lot of Georgetown grads, we tend to be a lot of type A's and go-getters. And we often, you know, just how much can we get out of the day? How far can we push ourselves? How little sleep can we go on? You know, we sort of often would pride ourselves on saying, I'm a machine. I only needed four hours of sleep. I'm getting this done and that done and I'm multitasking. And the reality is that can only hold up for so long. And then in the West, we tend to, the machine breaks, we go see the mechanic who's the doctor who, you know, does a quick fix, gives us a prescription, and off we go. And I would really like to switch that whole paradigm so that we become more of the gardeners. We become more proactive in taking care of ourselves so we're not relying on going back to the seeing the mechanic to fix us with a pill or a prescription. Um, so that's really become my mission. Um, my journey from uh, college, uh, co-ed, to my late 30s when I was working in corporate America, had four kids, was just feeling really wired and tired, relying on too much coffee to get me going, wine at night to wind down, and just not showing up for my kids or my job the way I wanted to with the energy that I was hoping for. So I really started to dive into as much education as I could. I read everything on health and well-being that I could find. I took a bunch of classes online. I became a yoga instructor. I became a nutrition coach. And um, what I found was the more I learned, I wanted to share it with others. And my mission really became to educate myself and then share that with as many people as possible. And um, it's funny, another Georgetown alum, Father Paulson, uh, once said, when you can find something that you're passionate about, that you're good at and that the world needs, you found your purpose. And I truly feel that I have found my purpose with health and well being education because I'm super passionate about helping others. I love to present to others and put on events. And I really think the world needs this. Um, so, with that, I, I wrote a book during this pandemic. So, my pandemic project 
was a book because I couldn't uh, put on any events or retreats this past year. And I had, you know, five years of teaching under my belt. And I thought, you know, I'm going to distill this all down into a simple coffee table book that could resonate with anyone at any age um, who's looking to pick up little tips for how they can improve their well being. So I'm going to go ahead and just show you a little video that gives you a high level um, preview of what. Um, what uh, my book is all about. Let's see. So this is my book and um, as you can see, it's very um, colorful, a lot of beautiful photography that I worked with a local photographer in Chicago to um, take photos of myself and my family in places that were really um, meaningful to me. Um, and I'm a very visual person. So I really wanted to incorporate um, beautiful photography because to me, sometimes we're inspired by words and sometimes we're inspired by photography. And so whatever moves you um, in the moment is something that's going to get you to make some healthier steps towards your own well-being, to become that gardener, to become that CEO. Um, so the book is meant to be something that you leave out that hopefully you get inspired by um, when you pick it up. Or um, the other thing I like to say to people is if you pick up the book and you find there are things in there that you're already doing, that you celebrate those and give yourself a pat on the back. We tend to be so hard on ourselves. Um, and it's nice to say, you know what? I'm already doing, I'm already adding lemon to my water. So yay for me, give yourself a pat on the back and, um, and celebrate that. And then, you know, when you're feeling inspired to maybe uh, when you're like, I've got hydration down, maybe you turn to another chapter and you're like, now I'm ready to tackle this. So with that, um, I'm going to walk you through my six chapters that are in the book, Nurture and Thrive. Again, Nurture and Thrive, as the title suggests, nurturing our own well-being on a daily basis so that we can thrive. You know, again, I think as a 50, almost 51 year old woman, I can say that I want to not only be alive, I want to thrive. I want to be pain-free. I want to wake up each day energized, um, ready to tackle the day, showing up uh, for my family and friends with my best self, um, rather than dragging and feeling wired and tired. So that's really the goal of this book. So there are six chapters, hydrate, nourish, move, sleep, breathe, and then most of all, love, which is our final chapter. So I'm just going to give you the high level, um, maybe two tips from each chapter that hopefully you're going to take away today with something that you can put into action in your own life, um, wherever you are, again, at any age, at any time you feel inspired. So let's start with hydration. This one I love to start with because it's probably the most, the easiest and often the most overlooked. We are 70% water, our bodies, we crave it. We need it to function at our best. Um, and it's almost like so simple that we overlook it. So making hydration part of your daily well-being is one of the simplest things we can all do. And I think we all know Tom Brady, who just won his 17th Super Bowl. He's been talking about hydration for years. He calls press people out, asking them how much they're drinking. And he's sort of made it cool, which I applaud. So. Um, I wonder, I'm going to ask, you know, just a poll to check in with yourselves, like how many of you know how much water you should be drinking in a day? So I can't see your faces, but I'm going to ask for a show of hands, virtual hands, if you know how much water you should be drinking in a day. Well, I can tell you that I didn't, you know, I heard, had always heard eight glasses of water, but that was just very hard for me to sort of get my head around. And one of the biggest tips I like to tell people is to have a hydration game plan. And that starts with knowing how much you should personally be drinking each day. So the easiest math equation for everyone is to know your weight and then divide that in half. And that's the amount of ounces you should be drinking each day. So if you're 140 pounds, you should be drinking 70 ounces of water a day. And that's your baseline. If you're super active or if you live in a really warm community and you're sweating a lot, then you're gonna to wanna to up that hydration. But you should know that 70 ounces is a baseline. So if this water bottle here that I take everywhere with me is 16 ounces, you know, I'm gonna to wanna to drink three, four of these a day. 
and then I know that I've hit my hydration goal. So I encourage you all to do that little math right now in your head or on a piece of paper, and then you have that number and there's no sort of ambiguity around it. Um, one of my number one other tips is to have a bottle of water next to your bed. It makes it a no-brainer. You wake up in the morning, first thing you do, you drink some water. That's when your body needs water the most. It's dehydrated. It's been detoxing overnight, again, doing all this work for you while you sleep. So first thing in the morning, you're drinking a big glass of water before you even think about having that cup of coffee. So I, I don't let myself have a cup of coffee until I've downed a whole large bottle of water in the morning. And I highly recommend that as a key strategy to getting your hydration in every day. Now, I know I hear from a lot of people that boring that water can be boring and um, they just don't either like the taste or they just find it boring. So I always like to suggest that you get a little creative with your water. So infusion profusion. And so have fun you know, play around with fruits and herbs um, to make different combinations of pitchers at night before you go to bed. So when you wake up, you've got this wonderful option to fill your water bottle with that's so much more interesting than, the, than just a plain um, glass of water. So these are some of my favorites. I've got right here this um, citrus blend, which is lemon, lime, orange. This is a hit with my whole family. And then you can also have fun with teas. This is the rooibos passion tea um, that I made and I just threw in some strawberries. And again, a great option to have in your fridge um, just to change things up. And then you don't have to reach for those sugary drinks like Gatorade that have all these unnecessary additives that um, really uh, do much more harm than good for your hydration. So the next chapter is nourish. And I'm coming to you today from my kitchen and that was really a purposeful choice um, because to me, this is where our well being really starts. You know, when we make that decision each day of how to nourish ourselves, um, we can set ourselves on a good path or a bad path for our own well being. So each time you pick up the fork, you're making a decision on how you want to nourish your body. So, how, where, to, where to begin? It's a very confusing time. You know, there's so much information out there on um, diet and what, you know, paleo versus vegan versus Atkins, um, keto, you name it. Um, and every time you open up one study, you can find another study that's refuting that. And it can just make you crazy. So the number one thing I like to say to people is if you start by just eating real food, and when I say real food, I mean things that God made. So real fruits, vegetables, animal proteins, if you're into that, uh, fish, um, and less things that come from a package or a bag. So cutting out that ultra processed food that really isn't food, it's been engineered in a laboratory um, to look like food, um, but the reality is it's really not nourishing your body. So a good mantra is, if it was made in a plant, leave it. And if it comes from a plant, eat it. So the more you can eat real food, the better. Um, and keep it simple in the kitchen. This I'm not a great chef, but I know that just with a few ingredients, I can make any food taste delicious. And those simple things are a great olive oil. This is one of my favorites. So if you're gonna make one investment coming out of today, I would say invest in a really good olive oil, a great salt. This Himalayan sea salt is one of my favorites and something acidic like a lemon or apple cider vinegar. Those three things, you can make a salad dressing, you can roast vegetables with, you can really make anything taste terrific. So um, acid, salt, um, uh, vinegar and heat, and there's a book by a wonderful um, chef about that in a Netflix series. Um, so if you're more interested in that, uh, check it out. Um, you can really make anything taste delicious. And my second tip, again, just to keep it simple, is to really look at your plate and make sure every time you're making a plate, you have the key three. The key three are a nice assortment of vegetables, colorful vegetables. So the more colors you can get on the plate, the better because every color has different phytonutrients that your body needs. 
So a red pepper is gonna give you something different than green kale. So the more variety and color you can incorporate in your diet, the better. Um, a healthy fat, here we've got an avocado. Um, healthy fats, your brain is made mostly of fat. It craves fats. When you give it fats, it turns on, you perform better, you think better. Um, and then a lean protein. Here we've got an egg. This could be um, some chicken, some um, fish, whatever sort of protein you like. But I love this visual because really looking at your plate and saying, do I have the key three? Do I have some colorful vegetables? Do I have a lean protein, a healthy fat, and other healthy fat options other than avocados or olive oil, nuts, seeds? Um, and knowing that when your plate looks like this, you are nourishing your body. You're really eating with purpose and you're giving it all the nutrients and vitamins and minerals it needs to perform at its very best. And break up with beige. You know, when you get a plate and it drives me crazy that a lot of the kids buffets, if you ever, next time you look, you'll see it's like beige, 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 chicken nuggets, uh, French fries, bread, pasta. And you know, that's exactly what the kind of plate we don't want to have. So make it colorful, make sure it has the key three. All right. The next, uh, area I want to talk about is move. So movement is, I like the word move because I think it's better than exercise. Exercise can sound daunting to a lot of people that aren't into it, or, you know, you have people that are so into it, they really tax their body too much. But movement is really meant to encompass how our bodies are made and how we are literally meant to move. So we need to make sure we're incorporating that into our daily lives. And, you know, back in the day, we would have moved just by the nature of our jobs or our garden or going to have to get food from the store. Um, and now with the convenience of our computers and technology, it's easy to go a whole day without even leaving your house or moving, which really does our body disservice, especially over time. So I really like to encourage everyone to find a movement you love and do it. And there's no right or wrong, like, well, I do Pilates and that's the best. Whatever works for you is what is best and that you'll be consistent with. And I think one thing we can all agree on is that walking is wonderful. So if nothing else, making a daily habit of going for a walk, and I really like to recommend first thing in the morning is one of the number one tips that everyone should be doing to improve their overall well-being. So when you get up in the morning, have your shoes somewhere that you can see, lace them up. I have two dogs, so it's not an option for me to not go out for a walk. Um, but I get up in the morning, I lace up my shoes, I take my dogs out for a walk, and just that um, ritual and discipline of getting out and moving, being in nature, and also getting that sunlight, which sends a signal to your brain that it's time to wake up, stop producing melatonin, and uh, you know, gets you more in sync with your circadian rhythm. So a morning walk without sunglasses is really one of the very best things that anyone can do for their health. So I hope that you'll all consider doing that wherever you are in the country as part of your well-being routine. The next is to become a movement opportunist. Um, again, we're sitting at our desk so much. Um, it's easy to go the whole day with, you know, going from one Zoom to the next. I have four kids and I look at them um, at home these last few months and they are just, you know, on their computer um, hour after hour with very little movement and it breaks my heart. So I think whatever we can find time to set maybe a reminder on our phone or on our computer that it's time to get up and move a little stretch here and there, because otherwise, you know, hours can blend into hours and Zooms into another. So be a movement opportunist, find time to stretch. So with that, I'm gonna ask you all to join me and we're gonna do a little stretch. So if you're sitting, um, I invite you to stand up. And again, no one else can see you, so don't, don't feel embarrassed um, right now. And let's go ahead and Stand up, and we're just going to do a few simple stretches that are going to feel really good and change your energy completely. So let's go ahead and roll our shoulders back five times. It's really getting the blood flowing. And then let's roll them forward five times. Great. And then go ahead and just shake out your arms. 
And then let's go ahead and sweep our arms up to the sky, grab a hold of your wrist and go ahead and tilt your body to one side, really opening up that whole side body for a stretch. Breathing, inhale as you come up, switch wrists, go to the other side for a nice full body stretch on this side. Beautiful. And then exhale as you release your arms down. And then again, no one else can see you. So the other thing I love to tell people to do is just jump. Just bounce around a little bit and shake up that energy in your body, get it unstuck. And whew, settle back down. Love for you to just check in with yourself. How do you feel now versus right before we did that little stretch and energy movement? I hope that you're aware that getting everything unstuck and moving um, can do wonders for your body, your skin, your blood flow, your mental energy. So um, make that a habit. Okay, sleep. Sleep is one of the most underrated uh, aspects of health. It really is the foundation for all of our well being. So, how do we make sleep more of a priority? I think the best analogy I think we can all have about what happened, you know, I think for so long we didn't know what happened when we slept, but now there's been all these amazing studies. Matthew Walker out of uh, Berkeley has an amazing sleep institute. He's written a book that I highly recommend called Why We Sleep. Um, and it's really, they're finding out all of these things that our brain does and our body does when we're sleeping. And it's essentially, like my best analogy is if you had a big party, think back to your parties in college and maybe uh, the red solo cups are left everywhere, a couple pizza boxes out and you go to bed and uh, you don't, you know, you don't clean that up and you come down in the morning and it's all still there. Well, that's what happens when you don't get a really great eight hour restorative night of sleep versus when you get a great night of sleep, you're coming down in the morning and that whole party scene is cleaned up. No more red solo cups, no more pizza boxes. That's what happens when you let your body do its work at night. So your brain is able to file memories, get everything organized. Your body is able to repair any sort of wear and tear that um, you know you might have injuries. So it's really important to know that your sleep time is doing wonders for your mind and body. So the biggest thing, I think the hurdle again is these days we're always on, we have so many devices, we're connected. It's easy to always have that phone next to our bed and look one more time at TikTok or Instagram before bed or check those emails, but our bodies are not meant to go from one extreme to then expecting it just to hit the pillow and go to sleep. We need a wind down routine. And one of my best analogies is to think about babies or you know, if you were raising a child at some point, you knew innately that they needed to take a bath, sing some songs, have a wind down routine, be rocked. All of those things send cues to the body that it's time to relax and unwind and go to sleep. So I encourage you to have some sort of wind down routine. I personally love to take an Epsom salt bath and I do so every night. And that I highly recommend if you have a great bathtub to take a wonderful bath or take a hot shower. Um, that sends a signal to your body that it's when you get out, your body temperature drops and it likes things cool to sleep. So that's a wonderful wind down routine. But if you like soft music or having a cup of chamomile tea, whatever you do to send signals that let's start getting ready for bed. Um, the next tip I have for you around sleep is set your sleep environment up for success. So in your bedroom for the best sleep, you need three things. You need it cool, dark, and quiet. Cool, your body likes to sleep in cold. So set that thermostat to 68 degrees and uh, you know it's fine to have blankets, but just know that you're gonna be, you're gonna have a better night of sleep when it's cool. Dark, invest in some blackout shades. Um, the more dark, the better, because that sends a signal to your brain when you have total darkness to produce melatonin, which is the sleep hormone. And it only will do that when it senses total darkness. If blackout shades aren't an option, then invest in a good eye mask and sleep with that. And then finally, quiet. If you live in an urban setting or somewhere, make sure your windows are closed at night so you have better quiet or shut your door or invest in a nice little sound machine to make sure it's quiet. So cool, dark, and quiet for optimal sleep environment. All right, two more pillars left. 
So we're gonna talk about breathe. Now this one I love, and this is one of the most underrated, I think, um, aspects of our well-being. We, the first thing we do when we're on this earth is we take a breath, and the last thing we do when we leave this earth is take a breath. And in between, we're taking breaths about 24,000 times a day, usually on automatic. And so the more we can start learning how to um, manipulate our breath and use it to our advantage, the better. So um, I'd love to uh, tell you that one of the easiest things you can do is start learning how to nasal breathe. So when we breathe in through our nose, we have this built-in filter that really helps oxygenate our body better. And so breathing in through our nose and really getting deep into the diaphragm rather than that shallow chest breathing that does not um, do as good, much good for the body. So I invite you now just to go ahead and put your hands on your rib cage and then go ahead and take a nice deep inhalation through your nose and feel your rib cage expand and then exhale it out. You, that's how you want to breathe. You really want to get into that deep um, diaphragm breathing for the most benefits. So another way we can manipulate our breath to help send signals to the body to calm down, you know, that ever since probably you were a small child, someone said, you know, to you, take a deep breath. Well, there's a reason why we innately say that because it sends a signal to the body, like it's okay, we're not being attacked by an animal. We can shift into rest and digest, which is the parasympathetic nervous system and the body can relax out of a, uh, a state of stress and anxiety. So um, one of the best breathing tips I can give you is something called four, seven, eight breathing. And I'm happy to say that my mother who's in her eighties uses this technique. She says when she's stressed, my 18 year old son uses this every night before going to bed. And uh, my 13 year old daughter just told me the other day that when they were in a uh, big basketball game this weekend and they were feeling stressed before the game, they started practicing this four, seven, eight breathing. So it's really simple. Again, anyone can do it at any age. And it's some, it goes like this. You're gonna inhale through your nose for four seconds. You're gonna hold your breath for seven seconds. And then you're gonna exhale out of your mouth for eight seconds. And the science behind this, in case you're wondering, is that when the exhale is twice as long as the inhale, it sends a signal to your whole nervous system to switch into the parasympathetic state. So again, no tiger is coming, you can rest and everything's gonna be okay. So let's go ahead and do this together. Real simply, go ahead and if you wanna close your eyes, you're gonna breathe in through your nose for four seconds, so I'll do the counting. So let's begin. Breathe in through your nose for four, three, two, one, hold it for seven, six, five, four, three, two, one, and exhale it out of your mouth for eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. Really making a whoosh sound out of your mouth as you exhale can do wonders for um, making sure that you're letting all that air out. So I highly encourage you to add this tool to your toolbox. It will help with anxiety. It'll improve your sleep. Just doing a few rounds of four, seven, eight breathing. Another one simply is to open your windows in your home. Um, the air in your home is much more contaminated than the air outside due to clean chemicals and uh, pet dander and other things that come in our house on our shoes. So simply making a practice of opening your windows, no matter what the temperature is for um, you know, a half an hour a day to let that circulation run through the house, especially when you're using cleaning products, open your windows. That's such a simple thing, but we often forget, especially when you live in places like Chicago where um, opening the windows doesn't seem so appealing many, many times of the year. The last pillar is love. Now this one's my favorite, near and dear to me. Um, and when I talk about love, it might not be what you think. Um, it's really about connection. So how we connect in three ways, with ourselves, with nature, and with others. Um, and really making that a priority. How do you spend time each day connecting with either yourself, nature, or loved ones? So one of the uh, ones I love to do, especially in this community, is talk about friendship. 
how you nurture your friendships. We are social creatures, and especially as this pandemic has shown us, it's really hard to be isolated and alone. And the more we can fuel our souls by connecting with the people that we love and care about, the better. And it can be really hard, especially in times like this. But the key is to make it a priority to nurture your friendships and put it on the calendar. It means making a date with a friend to go for a walk, making a date to have a coffee or a Zoom call. I know when the pandemic first started, one of my girlfriends got all of us Hoyas together on a weekly Zoom call. Um, and it meant so much to see all of those spaces and feel connected and supported. So nurture those friendships, make them a priority. And this is a picture of my family at our family farm up in Northern Illinois. And um, I wanted to include this one too, because sometimes we forget to make the time to connect with the people that we live with, you know, the ones that we see every day to make meaning, meaningful connections with them. And for me, um, one of the tips that's helped me the most is to, every time I greet my family members is to do a three point greeting. And that's very simple. That's to connect on three senses. So when you see your loved one, make eye contact. It's so easy to be looking at our phone when they come in the door, but make eye contact, say, say a kind word and uh, a point of touch. So that can be a hand on the shoulder or a hug. The three point greeting, and I promise you, you're gonna feel more connected than ever before. And it's just so simple, but sometimes we need to be reminded to do those things. And then finally, um, in the book, I've got a little toolkit that shows how you can set your environment up for success. You know, I think the more we can do around our home to make sure that we're successful, like having a glass of water next to our bed to remind ourselves to drink first thing in the morning or like investing in a really good olive oil and leaving it out with some lemons. Um, all of those things will help be cues to you to take better care of yourself. Um, and I'm happy to say this is my son, Brendan, um, and he is going to be in the class of 2025. So I'm very thrilled to, that I'm gonna have a reason to return to the hilltop often these next four years. Um, and I feel really good in knowing that he is going to the hilltop armed with a lot more knowledge about how to take care of his own well-being than say I was. And I know that he makes really good choices about the food that he puts in his body and he makes that connection between what he's eating and how he's feeling. And he knows that if he's, if he's choosing to have pizza or you know he's gonna stay up all night playing video games that he's going to not perform as well the next day and he makes that connection. Um, so, uh, and he's really good about his water too. Uh, no no uh, sports drinks for this guy. So, and no Diet Coke and definitely no bagels. So, so I'm pleased to say that hopefully um, he'll, spread some of that knowledge on the hilltop. And I do think that this generation is a lot more knowledgeable about how to take care of themselves. Um, but with that, I am gonna open it up for, um, oh, one last thing, sorry. Um, this is something I made for the group and I hope that um, Kelly's gonna send it out. This is the daily wellbeing check-in sheet. Um, and this is something that you can all download and print and do every day or you can do as a practice with your family members. Um, and I love this because I think, again, we often cannot even, we can go through our days without even really checking in with ourselves. How are we really feeling? And how are we spending our time? And how are we truly nurturing ourselves so that we can thrive really well? Um, so these are my simple little uh, questions that you can ask yourself each day. Um, what's your mood on a scale of one to 10? How is your anxiety? How is your energy level? And again, you can be so honest because it's only for you. And then I've got little two little checks here under each pillar to remind you of these simple little steps that anyone can do to take better care of their own well-being. And then a little evening reflection, which I love, and that's really around the five C's. Um, and this is again, how are you spending your time and what's the why behind your, you know, what you're doing, who you're spending time with, uh, and is that connected with where you want to be and what your priorities and your purpose are? And so these questions sort of cue you to think about those things. Um, so I hope that you'll incorporate this, you know, either daily or weekly and share with family and friends um, and find it to be a useful tool.
Um, with that, I think we can open it up for questions, Kelly, if there's any from the group. Yes, Elizabeth, thank you so much for sharing all of these helpful reminders. Um, I particularly love that three, two, one greeting idea. Um, and we do have some audience questions coming in. And so I'm just going to take a moment to remind the audience that if they would like to submit questions, um, please do send them along via the questions section of your webinar control panel. Um, so one question going back to hydration uh, is when considering your daily hydration levels, do other beverages that include water count? Um, so that's a great question. Thank you to whoever asked that. Um, I would say tea definitely counts towards your water count. Um, water, tea, coffee can be dehydrating, so I would not count coffee in that. Um, definitely not any alcohol because that's super dehydrating. Um, but I would say water and tea uh, go towards your hydration count. But the rest, I would just say are nice, maybe added benefits. And then a lot, you often get a lot of follow-up question to that is what about sparkling water and mineral water? Um, I, you know, this is a one up for hot debate. <laughs> My family loves LaCroix and we love Topo Chico and mineral waters. Um, what I like to say is I think those are amazing and I love them too. And they're wonderful replacements over soda or juice, but in general still, hit your hydration goal with regular water or your infused natural waters, and then enjoy those sparkling water beverages um, in place of, say, alcohol or sports drinks or soda. Great. Um, so another question uh, or message, I should say, because there's there's a message within it too, uh, from Catherine Moore. How do you do the four, seven, eight, breathing without stressing out on the seven hold part and also thank you for doing this and congrats to your son Hoya Saxa. Oh thank you that's so nice. Um, I hear you. Um, I think that honestly like anything in life it gets better and easier with practice. So don't stress out about it. If you want to start um, maybe uh, less and again the key is that your exhale is twice as long as your inhale. So maybe you want to start with breathing in for one second, holding for two seconds and exhaling for three. You know, again, the key is that ratio of twice as long exhale to inhale. But the science that's, you know, really studied this has been around that four inhale, seven hold, eight exhale. But any amount is good. And I, the more you do it, the easier it'll get, I promise you. Great. Um, another question, do you have suggestions on emphasizing certain of these elements when recovering from illness? For sure. Um, I would say nutrition. Let's just start there. I mean, I think um, I often joke that I want to start a business for um, the amount of friends that I have that I feel like are like recovering from surgery, going to surgery. Um, you know, or unfortunately, you know, recovering from cancer, just diagnosed with something. Um, and the more that we can incorporate an anti-inflammatory diet, um, the better. So really knowing what foods in, you know, inflammation is the basis of almost every disease, heart disease, cancer, um, a lot of these autoimmune diseases. And so much of that can be alleviated with good diet choices. And again, it, doesn't have to be super complicated, but really um, whole real foods the way nature intended and cutting out the processed foods, which are just causing major inflammation in your body. So that would be my number one thing is every time you pick up that fork, ask yourself, is this feeding my body with nourishing nourishment or is this contributing to disease? And I'm sorry to be so black and white, but it really is that simple. Um, so a bag of Doritos versus a, my favorite avocado, I think we all know um, the difference and this is gonna do wonders for your health and the Doritos are just going to wreak havoc on your system. So choose an anti-inflammatory diet and that really is as simple as eating real foods from nature. So perhaps building on that a bit, um, Monica Kofi asks, what are some healthy breakfast ideas? I struggle with wanting a chocolate chip muffin every day. Um, do you have a go-to? you know, quick, healthy breakfast that you can share? Sure. Well, I, I was I was thinking back, like in addition to the bagels from Bowie Mongers, my other go-to was the muffins from Wisey's. 
but usually the muffin tops, which I, you know, they were just magical. And when I probably look back on that, I don't know, they're probably like a thousand calories of just sugar and flour and all sorts of bad things. Um, but boy, that I took those to Loinger Library and thought I was just doing such a good job. And <laughs> now I think back my poor self. Um, okay, my favorite go-to breakfast is an avocado. So I love just to cut this in half, slice it um, sideways, like kind of the picture I showed earlier of the key three plate, sprinkle some olive oil on that, a little bit of sea salt, a squeeze of lemon, and I can just eat it right out of the avocado. Um, and if I have more time, I'd love to accompany that with an egg. Eggs are the perfect food. They got such a bad rap for so long. They really give you healthy fats, protein. They're beautiful. They're, they should be um, on everybody's go-to list and none of that egg whites. Eat the yolk. That's where all the good nutrients are. So I would say, the simple avocado, you can make avocado toast. I'm happy to say my, uh, my, I have three daughters and they all love to come down and make avocado toast um, for breakfast and they've gotten really good at it. And so having some avocado toast and you can have fun and throw some vegetables on there or just eat it simply. Um, again, a little olive oil, a little sea salt, squeeze a lemon. Um, I recommend sourdough toast. Um, sourdough bread tends to be a lot easier on your system um, and it's usually gluten-free if you're getting the good sourdough. Um, so that would be my my number one tip. Wonderful. Muffin, um, so Sorry. I was like, skip the muffin. <laughs> um, so another question. Um, what olive oil would you recommend and why? I think you've mentioned, you know, a good olive oil and you showed your preference, um, though we couldn't quite see it. Yes, I have a few. Um, and actually, if you go to my website, which I think it's still up there, salveolifestyle.com, I just wrote a blog post. Um, you can sign up for my newsletter there. I send um, a newsletter out once a month, so not too often. Um, but my last newsletter, I called it Liquid Gold in honor of St. Patrick's Day. Um, but that was all about olive oils. So if you want a quick tutorial on that, um, please check out that blog post. Um, but essentially, uh, these are some of my favorites. Um, I have a whole uh, cabinet here of olive oils. Um, there's some great Greek, Italian um, olive oils. But if you look at that blog post, you're going to see um, the what you really want to know and that it's been um, harvested within the last 18 months, that it's all from one region. You really, if the olive oil is cheap, there's a reason. It's not real olive oil. So it's really worth getting educated and making that investment and using it liberally and often on everything because it truly is liquid gold for your system. So, I, you know, we go through at least a bottle a week um, and, you know, we roast vegetables, salad dressings, a little on the avocado, on the toast, you name it. Um, so invest in some good olive oils, ditch any sort of vegetable, canola oils. Those are super inflammatory. They wreak havoc on your system. So if you're gonna do one thing again out of today, please throw out any um, canola vegetable oils. Those are terrible for you and, um, and invest in a really good olive oil. Okay, great. And we can go ahead and link to, I think that blog post in our follow-up email as well. That would be great. And then, yeah, because it has some direct links to my favorite ones that you can order online now, which are great. Perfect. I mean, I think if, if you have time, Elizabeth, we do have a lot of questions coming in and we can just take two more um, if, that, if that's okay with your, your timing. Um, so can you speak to how you recommend getting your family members on board um, with adopting some of these well-being practices? Sure. Well, again, I have an 18-year-old son, a 16-year-old daughter, and then I have identical twin girls that are 13. So four teenagers in the house and my husband. Um, and, uh, you know, <laughs> I think now it's sort of been normalized, but back in the day, I just stopped buying crap. I literally, the number one thing I did was I was like, as the mom in the family and the one who does the grocery shopping, it's in my power to just not bring these things into my house. So let's start there. So I think making it harder to make bad decisions 
again, setting your environment up for success is really great. Now, I know my husband sometimes still sneaks some, you know, a bag of Hershey Kisses or whatever, but um, but I like to make it as difficult for them as possible. Um, and, you know, again, this kind of 80-20 rule, I mean, I think is a good one to live by too. You know, we eat really healthy, I would say, you know, most of the week. And, you know, if the kids want to get donuts on Saturday morning, I'm fine with that. Um, and if we want to get pizza on Sunday night, that's okay too. But then come Monday, we're back at it with our avocado toast in the morning and our salmon for dinner. And I think that now really teaching them to make that connection. So like when my daughters want to have, um, some sort of, you know, cereal for breakfast, I'll say to them, fine, you can have the cereal today, you know, today, but then tomorrow we're going to have the avocado toast and the egg. And I want you to start being aware of how you feel at 10 o'clock when you're at school. Um, are you having a sugar crash? You know, is your blood sugars dropping? Do you feel tired? Do you, are you craving more sugar uh, versus um, when you've had those healthy fats and proteins for breakfast? And I will tell you, I'm also having these same conversations with my parents who are in their 80s. You know, I was just had the pleasure of staying with them. And, you know, I, I love them to death, but like my dad's having of orange juice and cereal for breakfast. And I'm thinking, well, you know, I know we can do better here with the choices that you're making because aren't you feeling like, you know, that sugar crash mid morning. And so having those conversations with my parents and now they've made all those adjustments and they're incorporating different things. He's having some sausages and an egg now, and my mom's making green smoothies. And it's been so great to see that again, it's never too early and it's never too late to make these um, choices in our life. So I, I guess to sum up, having people be aware of how they feel when they eat certain things, um, because then they can start to become empowered to make better decisions. Um, how are their energy? How does their skin look? That's another one, again, as a mother of three teen daughters, like I will say to them, you know, when you've gotten a good night of sleep or you've drank the right amount of water, look at your skin and look at, be honest, like, no, you can't buy that in a cream. Um, nothing Kylie Jenner is selling you is going to uh, make you look this good. And guess what? You're not going to need much makeup when your skin is glowing because you're nourishing your body in the right way. Thank you. And I think one last question that's a great one to end on is, you know, with all of these tips that you've shared, what is the number one piece of advice that you put above all else? Well, I think I touched on it earlier, and that is to go for a morning walk. Um, because to me, it hits on so many things. It gets you moving first thing on the day, which again is like your body just thanks you. It gets your blood flowing. Um, it reminds you how good it feels to move. Um, you're getting out in nature, which again, I think the more we can make connecting with nature a, um, a priority, the better we feel. And when you're outside, you're getting the all important vitamin D which fuels your mood, your um, improves really everything about your, it's a hormone. So when we get our D, we feel better, um, our mood is better and we look better. And then, you know, again, on that morning walk, you're getting exposed to morning sunlight, which sends a signal to your body to stop producing melatonin. So you really wake up um, and then you get more in sync with your circadian rhythm. So it's amazing what a simple morning walk outside in nature, exposing yourself to sunlight, will do. And it doesn't have to be super long either. I mean, mine is I walk my dogs to our local coffee shop and get my morning coffee and then come back. And, you know, it's usually about 15 minutes. And but it really just sets my day on the right path. So I would highly recommend um, that above all else is taking that morning walk. Wonderful. And I think the perfect note to end on. Um, if you have any, you know, last thoughts, go ahead and share them. Um, and yeah, we'll thank you. Out. Thank you, Kelly. Well, I'm just so grateful to this Georgetown community. It really has always felt like home to me. And um, I'm excited, like I said, to be back on the hilltop with my son in the fall and look forward to, you know, connecting more with alumni. And I hope that you all have found something useful in this presentation. And if you're interested in my book, you can purchase it at salveolifestyle.com. I'm also on Instagram, um, salveo underscore lifestyle. I think Kelly will provide some links to that. And I have some really, a lot of free content on my website that 
um, summarizes all these tips. There's some helpful little videos about each um, each pillar, and I hope that everyone just finds something that they can uh, incorporate into their life and start becoming the CEO of your own health and tend to that garden each day and nurture yourself. You're worth it so that you can thrive and feel and look your best this year and beyond. Elizabeth, thank you for taking the time to share your story and expertise with our alumni community. Thank you all for joining us today. Please look out for our follow-up email, which will include more information on upcoming programs and from Elizabeth, as well as a link to today's recording. Thank you again. Hope you all have a great day and Hoya Saxa. Thank you.